So a big welcome back to the Resources Conservation and Recycling webinar program. My name is Mitchell Jones. I'm the Outreach Editor at Resources Conservation and Recycling. We're very glad to have you with us today. Uh, I will be your host. We have uh, a couple of honored guests with us today who will be speaking. I will introduce those in just a moment. But before I do that, a few notes on the program in case it's your first time joining us or just some general information. So this is our English language webinar program from the journal Resources Conservation and Recycling. We also have a Chinese language webinar program. So if you're in the uh, Asia region and you speak Chinese, then be sure to check that out. Uh, the scope of our program is quite broad. Uh, we run this program at 10 o'clock a.m. Pacific time every second Thursday. And the scope of the program is basically matching the scope of the journal. So you can expect to see all the sorts of articles that you would find in resources conservation and recycling as presentations in this, in this program. And we don't really have um, a preference or, or um, any kind of bias towards certain research areas. We basically take a selection of what we think are really impactful, exciting articles that are accessible to a broad audience. And we offer, as I said, uh, a couple of invitations, it's two invitations for each issue. Um, and that's how our program is run. The emphasis really is on accessibility. So we wanna make these webinars interesting and, and insightful and accessible for as many people as possible. We know that research areas are often deep and complicated things that can be very difficult to understand. And we basically wanna provide a program where people can dive into other research areas that may be perhaps adjacent to theirs or uh, that they may be interested in without it being too confrontational. So we ask that the speakers are reducing the amount of jargon, reducing the amount of research spe field specific uh, terminology, and really focusing on trying to explain background principles and provide that kind of holistic uh, presentation that somebody who may not know necessarily know that much about the topic can also enjoy. Registration for the program is necessary. So you can find the registration links in the Re Resources Conservation Recycling newsletters that are circulated at the end of each month. You can also find them in the dedicated webinar program emails, or else you can also find them on social media accounts, the official journal social media accounts. So on X, on LinkedIn, on Twitter. You can also find them on the Alzavia website for the web page for resources conservation and recycling. If you go to the about um, tab or the about menu and you go to webinar calendar, you will find all the upcoming webinars there with their registration links for you to register. And you can also find all the previous webinars archived there. So touching on the previous webinars, they are archived to YouTube. You can find them at youtube.com YouTube forward slash at symbol RCR journal. Uh, all of our content is also live streamed there. So this webinar right now is also being live streamed to YouTube. So if you prefer to use YouTube rather than Zoom, you can watch it there at the same uh, web page. As a final note, we do really appreciate your feedback. So we've been really, really appreciative of the number of people that have been filling out surveys. We have a really great response rate. Thank you to everybody who's done that. We can only adapt the program to your preferences if you let us know what you're thinking. So be sure to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. It's just six questions. It'll take you only a couple of minutes. Coming to today's program, I'm just going to share my screen now. So we've had our welcome address. I'm gonna provide a very brief introduction to the journal before I get to introduce our speakers who we're very lucky to have with us today. Then we're gonna to touch briefly on how things are run here each week in terms of the, the administration side of things. We're gonna have a 20 minute presentation, 10 minutes for questions, and then some information on the next event and some closing remarks. So I'm sure that you're all familiar with the journal, Resources Conservation Recycling. The, the sort of content of the journal, I think, is pretty clear from the name. We're interested in everything resources, conservation, and recycling. Specifically, uh, the sort of points that we really touch on mainly are systems-wide strategies, technological, economic, institutional, and policy focus, resource management practices, 
conservation, recycling, and resource substitution, resource productivity improvement, restructuring of production and consumption profiles, and transformation of industry. So if you have any top-notch research in those areas, we would love to see it in resources, conservation, and recycling. From an admin perspective, please keep all communication over the course of the uh, webinar in English. So if you have any questions for the speakers, please provide it in English so that everybody can understand. We have closed captions available and activated currently. So if you prefer to watch the webinar uh, without audio, or if perhaps English is not your first language and you would prefer to have a, a subtitle text, it's available to you. You just have to switch it on. If you have any questions, be sure to post them in the Q&A during the presentation. We will go through those questions in order of popularity. So you, if you see a question there that you really think is a question that you might have asked or that you think is very interesting, be sure to upvote it so that we can get to it uh, a little bit sooner than the others, especially if we are running short of time. If you prefer to ask your question in person, we also allow that. So if you would like to ask your camera, uh, ask your question through the camera or the microphone um, or both, you, uh, you can do so. You just need to indicate that you want to do that by using the raised hand reaction. If we have excess time, i.e. if the time allotted to questions is not exhausted, we'll be happy to welcome you directly onto the floor to ask your question. So then our presenters for today, we are honored to have today with us uh, Gregory Kulian from the University of Michigan and Christian Hitt also from the University of Michigan. So a brief introduction to, to Greg. Um, he's going to be speaking with us, well, Christian also on the topic of parametric life cycle assessment comparing reusable and single use restaurant food container systems. So Dr. Gregory Kulian, earned his PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Michigan. His research focuses on developing and applying life cycle models and metrics to enhance the sustainability of products and technology. He has pioneered new methods in life cycle design, life cycle optimization of product placement, life cycle cost analysis, and life cycle based sustainability assessments ranging from energy analysis and carbon footprints to social indicators. Professor Kulian currently teaches inter interdisciplinary graduate courses on sustainable energy systems and industrial ecology and serves as the director of the University of Michigan Center for Sustainable Systems. He also co-directs MI Hydrogen, as well as the Engineering Sustainable Systems dual degree program and the Rackham Graduate Certificate Program in Industrial Ecology. A big welcome to Greg. Uh, I'm going to now introduce Christian. Christian Hitt from the same university and the same topic presentation. Christian Hitt earned his Master of Science in the Environment and Sustainability, Sustainable Systems, and his Master of Science in Engineering in Environmental Engineering at the University of Michigan. He has worked with clients and industry partners to source data and develop methods for life cycle assessment models for packaging systems. His areas of interest include life cycle assessment, systems modeling, renewable energy, circular economy, and engineering sustainable systems. He currently works as a research area specialist associate at the University of Michigan Center for Sustainable Systems. A big welcome to both of you. Uh, I will now cease uh, screen sharing so that you both can, uh, well, one of you can screen. Thank you. Thanks. So Christian, um, you're gonna share the presentation. Yeah, are you guys able to see this? Yep, just gotta put it in presenter mode. How's this Great. looking? Great, good. Well, thank you, Mitchell, for the introduction. Very much appreciate it. And wanna welcome uh, everyone to the webinar today or those that are gonna view it later on YouTube. Um, we're looking forward to engaging with you about our parametric LCA study of reusable and single-use restaurant containers. I actually have a reusable container next to me uh, that I brought my lunch in today. Um, so um, we're pleased to share the work, but uh, next slide. Um, I want to give you a quick overview of our Center for Sustainable Systems where this research was done. Uh, the Center for Sustainable Systems is an evolution of the National Pollution Prevention Center, which was established by EPA in 1991. 
Um, we coined the term sustainable systems back in 1997 and launched the center in 99. And our mission is about advancing system science for climate action and a sustainable society uh, with a vision to really accelerate high impact transformation of systems, um, including food packaging. Uh, you can see a generic systems diagram here that shows all the levers for transforming systems from incumbent to more enhanced sustainability. Uh, and a big focus of our center is on assessment and uh, systems analysis to inform the levers for intervention and how to improve the performance, sustainability performance. And we're gonna talk about several of those levers related to restaurant container systems today. And the systems analysis tool or assessment method that we're gonna be using and applying in this study is life cycle assessment. Next slide. So I'd like to acknowledge the sponsor of our study. Um, we received funding support from Morgan Stanley uh, through a plastics waste reduction uh, research and fellowship program. And this included three studies. Um, the first was doing a material flow analysis, a spaghetti diagram of plastics <clears throat> in the US economy from production to use and end of life management. That was followed by a study to develop a guidance document to evaluate sustainability performance of plastic waste reduction interventions. And then that led to the current study, the parametric uh, modeling effort. And I'm gonna turn it over to Christian now, who's lead uh, analyst on the study and lead author on the study uh, to present that research. Thanks so much, Greg. Um... So here we're going to talk about just some of the highlights of the study. In this first study, we developed a parametric model to compare life cycle impacts of reusable containers to a single use incumbent system across multiple impact categories. We found that reusable containers can outperform single use in all impact categories and that break even for global warming impacts was achieved in only four to six uses. Our parametric model allowed for sensitivity and scenario analysis, which primarily highlighted the importance of customer behavior on system impacts. Here we first assess the previous body of work for points of comparison, as well as to highlight some of the gaps in the current field of knowledge that our model may address. For example, Fender and Miller did find that not all reusable kitchen items would always break even with their single-use counterparts, highlighting the need for continuous assessment of single-use and reusable foodware systems. They also noted the reusable system sensitivity specifically to the use phase washing aspect of the life cycle. Studies have shown varying results in break-even points. Galigo Schmidt also noted the need to assess other materials used for takeout containers, and Coel et al. noted the importance of customer behavior and its lack of integration in current LCA methods. The current body of literature highlights the need for more container comparisons, along with LCA assessment of the sensitivity of consumer behavior, along with other system aspects other than the use phase washing. So to address the gaps in knowledge, we developed a parametric LCA model that is based in Excel. We utilized parametric modeling to conduct robust sensitivity and scenario analysis to improve our understanding of the environmental performance of reusable systems when compared to different single-use incumbent systems. We developed this model in order to study a wide array of parameters. And through our analysis, we were able to determine which parameters had the most impact on the system. Some of them that we're gonna discuss or you can see in bold here, such as return rates, customer transportation, and also washing. The model utilizes 
cradle to grave life cycle assessment where impacts are assessed and accounted for across the entire life cycle to assess reusable and single use containers, which are compared using an equivalent unit of function. In this case, we use volume of food delivered, and this is called the functional unit. This highlights the fact that one reusable container replaces many single use containers. Also, importing impact data from multiple databases for many different materials and processes, we were able to study these impact categories and understand parameter sensitivity across different metrics. In our first published analysis, we studied a reusable pilot program in Ann Arbor, Michigan. This system utilizes reusable polypropylene containers in a returnable model where customers take containers home and return them to any participating restaurant. In this system, the containers are centrally owned by either the city, the restaurants, or the system operator. In this program, there was no container deposit and containers are tracked through customer emails and it operates at a relatively low scale uh, with only four participating restaurants at this time. And washing here, it importantly, is distributed where each restaurant has its own dedicated washing facilities and is responsible for washing their own containers that are returned to them. Here are some of the original containers that are included in our model. Uh, we primarily focus our analysis in this presentation on the small reusable polypropylene clamshell and single use PLA in the gas clamshells but we also analyzed some of these other containers uh, in some of the supplementary material of our paper. And here is the process flow diagram, which showcases the system boundaries and the flow of materials through the lifetime of the container. In the materials production and manufacturing stages, we showcase different container production processes in parallel for different materials. And this diagram is essentially helpful in illustrating the processes which are most important for accounting in the LCA model. In order to populate our model with a variety of impact data uh, for many container and parameter options, we utilized a collection of databases. EcoInvent 3 accessed through SEMA Pro was used for primarily materials and process data, and Argonne National Lab's green model was used for electricity and most transportation impacts, and the US EPA's WARM model was used for end-of-life impacts. Here you can see the total life cycle impacts for each category measured under our base case assumptions, which just assumes 20 lifetime uses for the reusable container. Our results show that these reusable containers can outperform a single use PLA and the gas containers in all impact categories under these assumptions. For global warming impacts in particular, the reusable containers broke even in only four to six uses. And so you can see here in these graphs, that this is the different impact categories we measured with the reusable container you see is outperforming in, in all categories. But this was just under our base case assumptions. And the important thing about our parametric model is that we wanted to adjust different parameters within the system and figure out not only what the results were for a single uh, set of parameters, but what parameters were actually most important. And if our assumptions were incorrect, which, uh, which parameters would be most impactful on system impacts. And our sensitivity and scenario analysis did highlight some cases where the environmental benefits of re the reusable system were significantly reduced or even reversed. This was primarily seen in customer behavior throughout multiple mechanisms. The first of which shown here is dedicated trips or returning the reusable container by making a trip that otherwise would not have been made in a single use system. In our base case, we assume that all return trips are made only when purchasing another meal. So the transportation impact is allocated to the meal as opposed to the container, as this trip would have been made in either packaging system. 
But here we assess the idea of the dedicated trip. And where what we see here is that even at very small rates of participation, here you can see the percentage of extra transportation is essentially the amount of people on average who would return a container using dedicated transportation. And even at very small rates, you can see that blue line uh, quickly exceeds the uh, the life cycle impacts of the uh, two single use containers. And so it can quickly re cause a reversal in environmental benefits of reusable containers. Another mechanism for customer impact involves washing the containers at home. Many customers may feel the need to wash the container before returning it, but this creates excess washing as the restaurant must also wash the container due to health and safety standards. While this system is not as sensitive to this mechanism as transportation, high participation in excess washing can markedly erode the environmental benefits, as you see here in the, the impacts of global warming potential graph, where the as the mix of of people who participate in excess washing grows, you start to quickly approach the uh, the lines of the total life cycle impacts for the PLA and the single use uh, the gas clamshells. Another parameter measured in our analysis was the impact of the local electricity grid on life cycle impacts. This can affect many different uh, the many different areas within the use phase, such as the washing efficiency. Here we compare impacts in different NERC regions with RFC being the base case where the case study is located and the Hawaii and New York grids serving as extreme points of comparison in the US. And you can see here also some theoretical grid compositions we tested uh, to further analyze the extremes. And our results did show a notable impact on life cycle met metrics, especially global warming potential shown here. Uh, but the, the grid composition was much less impactful than our measured consumer behavior mechanisms. And one interesting challenge we faced in this research was the complexity of water accounting metrics. There is a wide array of metrics, including uh, water usage, consumption, scarcity, and accounting by water type that all created lots of different variations in accounting methods in different data sources. And that led to a lot of difficulties in the consistency of water accounting in our model. The accounting of hydropower highlighted this, these issues as it drives the impacts for electricity. Uh, this, is, this was seen primarily in water usage, which accounts for all of the water that actually flows through the dam, which results in electricity dominating the water usage metric, even when hydropower was a small portion of a grid composition. This led us to measure water consumption, which specifically is defined as water that's evaporated, incorporated into products, transferred into other watersheds, or disposed of in the sea. And even this was not perfect, though, as water consumption in hydropower is highly varied in different data sources, and it's highly spatially dependent due to different uh, evapotranspiration rates over even just the United States, which limited the quality of data available to us for uh, this metric. Our first study shows that Reusable container systems do show promise for reducing environmental impacts relative to some single use systems in the restaurant sector. It is important to consider that return rates for the returnable systems are critical and pilots have actually shown widely varying results in this data point and this data is not well tracked yet. Customer behavior also had a significant impact on these systems and must be accounted for in system design. We've been working with system designers on this and we are trying to currently develop strategies of consumer engagement that can actually hopefully lead to higher return rates and better, uh, better ideal behavior from the customers to actually realize the environmental benefits of these systems. And here's another interesting aspect of our work here is that we, it's had some recent relevance in 
the policy sector in Europe with the proposal of the PPWR or packaging and plastics, uh, packaging and packaging waste regulation, which includes mandatory reuse targets and even the elimination of single use packaging for dine in. In response, there has been an effort from certain stakeholders, including McDonald's and the European Paper Packaging Association to fund studies which showed favorable results for single-use packaging and criticize the proposed regulations. It has been interesting to see how our research plays a part in this discourse and has partially driven some of the analysis that we are working on now. And during the making of this presentation, there was a report that came out which actually featured our study and compared it with some of these industry reports with the hopes of showcasing the differences in the approach of academic papers and industry reports when it comes to the generation of scientific knowledge. We have also continued our work on this model since our first publication and are expanding and applying it to a proposed citywide system in Galveston, Texas. This primarily involves the modeling of a centralized washing system along with a citywide collection and return system. We also have made certain adjustments to the containers themselves, including new options for reusable containers with a new focus on cups, along with a wider comparison of single use options. To facilitate these comparisons, we also adjusted the functional unit to compare based on container volume as opposed to food volume, which results in a better comparison of materials as opposed to specific containers themselves. Our initial findings indicate that centralized washing does have the benefits of washing at scale and the impacts of collection can be marginal when operating at very high scale. And there also may be cost benefits associated with high scale when compared to distributed washing. And the achieved scale though does appear to dictate the economic and environmental viability of a centralized system as low scale results in much greater impacts per container. The reusable cups do seem to have a difficult time breaking even with exp expanded polystyrene foam cups, but do perform much better when compared to other single-use plastic and paper cups. And stainless steel reusables do retain much higher break-even points than polypropylene with the promise of hopefully a longer lifetime, though this can be again limited instead by return rates. We do hope to publish more details on this work in the coming months, though, to finalize some of these uh, this analysis. And here I would just like to acknowledge my research partner, Jacob, as well as Greg here for his mentorship throughout this research and some of the organizations who assisted with data collection and system definition. We would also like to again thank Morgan Stanley who funded this uh, research through the Plastics Waste Reduction Research and Fellowship. And please feel free to reach out via email with any inquiries and check our center's website for information about our work and similar research that you might be interested in. And thank you all so much for your time. And we would now like to open it up for questions. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much for that presentation, Christian and Greg. Also, that was, that was such an interesting presentation. And I think it touches on something that so many people could really benefit from, but so few people really understand. I mean, this is such an accessible concept. You know, everybody is so concerned these days about the environmental impact of packaging, but uh, a lot of people seem to have this blanket notion that, you know, multi-use is, is, is going to be always better than single use. And it's very interesting to see all the different factors that are affecting that. So um, as Christian said, they're happy to take any questions. If there's any questions, feel very free to post them in the chat. Before you, before we hit the, some of those questions, I'm just gonna give people a moment to, to ask their questions. Um, I was really personally interested to hear, you mentioned that you are potentially coming up with some ways that we could engage with consumers to try to like, as we said, that the issue here is we, we have these systems, LC and everything, we know um, how complicated it is uh, and, and how variable the, the 
environmental impact can be based on multiple factors like, you know, whether people are doing dedicated trips because our transportation is often so carbon intensive and the washing, washing at home, et cetera, is also a big problem for recycling. A lot of people, when they are separating rubbish, uh, they some of them are trying to decide to what degree you should wash it at home versus at a recycling facility, et cetera. So this is a huge problem where we have, um, we have the information, but it's very complicated and it's quite hard to get that through to consumers. So I'm really interested to hear what kind of uh, concepts you're thinking of to try to engage consumers and 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 sort of um, just inform them, bring them up to date with the fact that what may seem intuitively good for the environment may not necessarily be in good for the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've definitely... It's not something that we've been able to, you know, do a lot of testing on, but something that we think is very important is the actual interaction when the when the consumer is obviously getting the container itself. We think that 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 kind of interaction is where you can have a lot of uh, there's a lot of opportunity for education or incentives. Uh, there's op opportunities for you know using deposit systems to have financial. Uh, financial incentives as well as you know possible discounts or then also there's just you know the ability to have possibly some form of education piece where you know whenever you do participate in reusable programs the employees are able to inform you of the proper way to use it um, but yeah there, those are some of the the general things that we've tried to consider but you're only going to be able to really see what what works whenever we, these systems start to get implemented at a much higher scale yeah. so the thing um, oh, Chris sorry, has, Greg. yeah just has uh, reached out to um, and in terms of education with the community in Ann Arbor with the city of Ann Arbor um, you know to to uh, they, they had some outreach uh, for education and and I think the other uh, you know clearly the restaurants have a role um, and, you know, they, many of these restaurants offer both systems and options, but um, as they increase in scale, and if a whole city utilizes a system, then um, I think there'll be greater opportunities in terms of education that go with it um, to, to reach more of the, you know, the, those that are in the community. So one thing that really struck me with the presentation, I know that this is quite a specific case study and therefore this does come within the scope, but the burden of responsibility for this has been quite squarely placed in this particular case on the businesses, right? So it's the businesses that are driving this. They are the ones that are deciding this is what we want to offer. We're going to be the ones that are going to provide this information. And I applaud them for doing that. But is that is that the best way for it to be? Should there be some kind of other? Should the burden of responsibility also land with other parties, or is it a good way to do it with it with the business? What are your any thoughts on that? Yes, yeah, so uh, I the, think there's. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, you know regulations, legislation, policy can also be a way to shift and transform systems. We know, uh, for example, with beverage containers. Um, there's bottle deposits that have been very effective to in increasing redemption rates um, in, in terms of uh, recycling. Um, so I think there's, there's, there's an opportunity for policy. I think in terms of you know, implementing uh, some kind of legislation on reusable restaurant container systems, I think uh, would be, I think, valuable to have a demonstration at scale of that system, like we're we're doing modeling of right now, helping design and plan a reusable container system for a couple of uh, different cities. I think if we could show the efficacy of those programs, then we can move more towards uh, policy uh, for um, you know implementation. Do you want to add something to that, Christian? No, no, he, he no? Greg covered okay. it quite Beautiful. well, actually. So then perhaps maybe this is a little bit, I don't know, maybe this is an odd question. I don't know. Um, if you could, just, so we're talking about you guys, you know, you have an idea for a system. If you could have your dream system about how we could do this as experts in LCA, what would it be? I think it's tough to to kind of say, definitively what would 
be the best for sure as it's such an early sort of adoption it's it's at a very early and not mature stage so it would be something that you know we would say this is what looks most promising but it's not something i don't think we would ever commit ourselves to say like it has to be this way you know like we're always obviously open to hearing new results as they come along and that's going to be one of the most important things that comes that comes with the development of these systems and as we begin to implement these systems more you know what are the pitfalls what are the what actually doesn't work that might have we might have thought that would work in our models but is actually not translating very well into real life so there's definitely a lot of room still i think to to figure out what that ideal system looks like but i think as long as the there is there's good science behind it and there's people who are engaged in the design and the consumers are 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 very engaged and wanting to to participate in this system in the best way and are able to to follow the best practices i think that's the the core behind what would the best system might look like i would i would take it a little bit further i would say that we have demonstrated that the reusable system can outperform a single use system so that circular economy model can be effective. And, but we also show that you need the participation of consumers uh, to, to you know, follow best practices. Otherwise, it, as Christian showed, you erode the benefits. So um, idealized, yes, this reusable container system um, can be very effective. And, you know, a big part of the focus on plastics is is the end of life solid waste, right? Containers and packaging are 30% of solid waste in the United States, but we're about systems. So we look at the production of the container, you know, the, the materials, the manufacturing, the washing. It's a very important to take a systems view. And, um, but I think, you know, we've demonstrated um, that reusable can work and then it's about you know, selecting materials and materials affect durability. And so I think, you know, this model allows us to really design and plan, um, you know, for enhancing sustainability. And, you know, we're still, um, you know, Ann Arbor has demonstrated the program, uh, but now we're looking at taking it and increasing scale. And I think it's, it's very exciting. And I, I think there's a lot of promise. Yeah, and I just want to say how impressed I am that those that that has come out of a community initiative in terms of local businesses doing that. That's a uh, that's a great thing. That and their interest in doing that. That's that's really great. Um, yeah. So now that we've had a moment to collect a few questions, uh, I will switch to the questions from the uh, from the audience. Uh, uh, the first question is: uh, I am Dr. Madhu from Kerala, India. My question is: plastics instead of single-use plastic. Yeah, so I would say that it, I, yeah, it definitely depends on in terms of bioplastics. In many cases, they they still are single use plastics, and while that they can, you know, vastly reduce the uh, the materials production side of the the impacts, I think there is still a lot of concern over the proper disposal and infrastructure for proper disposal of bioplastics and other you know whether compostable or biodegradable plastics. Uh, they still can, you know, end up in the improper streams. And that's one of the big, I think, issues with primarily utilizing bioplastics. I think there is some possibility for may maybe reusable bioplastics, but in terms of what's, what's mostly available, I think it would, it would again be single use. And there is some, uh, there is some, yeah, uh, people who support the the use of yeah either bioplastics or compostable materials but again yeah we we think that 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 was some of the things we we studied here and as against two compostable uh single use options and we found that in many cases yeah they were it was it was still more beneficial to use the the reusable container so that that would be that i think there is still a place for for possibly the use of bioplastics but it would definitely have to be with proper infrastructure for disposal. Do you want to add anything, Greg? Um, nope. Yeah, I, I mean, we did study PLA and Vagas in terms of single use. Those are, you know, bio-based uh, plastics um, or materials, I should say. Uh, and 
Um, I think, you know, composting um, in terms of really providing a valuable resource, um, I think looking at containers to do that, I, I think it's, you know, limited. It's really just another way to manage uh, end of life is to compost it. But I, you know, I don't see it as a, um, those containers being really an important source for agriculture in terms of soil amendments and things like that. So I think it, you really have to look at the life cycle performance in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, energy, and other, other factors there. Uh, our second question is, what are the major drivers of the emissions associated with container washing, for example, electricity used for pumping, et cetera? Yeah, for, for container washing is primarily going to be like electricity used to power the like the machine dishwasher is actually what we found is the, the highest uh, factor in, in that aspect. But we also took into account energy associated with, you know, treating water and wastewater treatment. So that's mm -hmm. factored in. But as Christian said, it's, it's really dominated by the uh, energy for the equipment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, how many times the reusable containers can be utilized in order to obtain sustainability without affecting its functionality? You might want to talk about the break evens. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that, it, yeah, if I'm understanding correctly, um, the, the idea of obtaining sustainability is, I think, the idea of having lower life cycle impacts than a comparable amount of single use containers. And that's why we utilize uh, break even numbers, as I was saying, which we typically found in our base case was about four to six uses specifically for global warming potential impacts. Uh, but this can change depending on which impact you're looking at and how you adjust the parameters in the system. But that's those are the numbers that that we came up with for our for our base case. And it, as I said, yeah, that's the whole thing is that it can change. And that's what we wanted to try and demonstrate is that it's dependent on the the system that you're trying to replace as well. So these all have to be taken into effect. There's not uh, so much as a one number that that says, oh, you will always get these benefits. You know, it's it has to do a lot with not only the system you're replacing, but how you're implementing the new system. And as terms of affecting the functionality, I'm, I'm guessing that's a question with regards to durability, perhaps. And we generally find that at least in this, the, the current state, uh, the durability doesn't come as much as a factor as just the general return rates, which, you know, we, we assumed about a 95% return rate, which averages out to 20 uses over the average containers lifetime. And that is, is even can be kind of high for, for many, uh, for many systems as a lot of the pilots, as, as I was saying that pilots have shown kind of varying results and can be, have very low return rates where customers aren't engaging with the system well and aren't returning the containers. And so the, the, the life eventually ends in, in this, in, in our model, we, we have mentioned the idea of if you keep a container there it may be still providing some function. Uh, at like the, if a consumer keeps it as essentially like a Tupperware container, but it's not something that we are typically accounting for in the model since it's so hard to to model and and have good estimates on. So we, te we typically find that as opposed to durability, the the just return rates is going to be what is more limiting for for a container lifetime. Yeah, participation is very important, and um, but we did you know, define these thresholds at which you have to reuse to improve performance. And, you know, it, it's really, a, it's a, um, it's not absolute sustainability. It's an improvement in terms of enhanced sustainability. Uh, if we want to talk about absolute sustainability, we could look at thresholds and we know what we need to do, for example, globally with reducing carbon emissions. And, you know, by 2030, we have to cut carbon emissions in half. So you could, you could look at this container system and say, you know, we need to cut, cut greenhouse gas emissions in half. And what does that mean? And get to net zero. So we're on a path. Um, but these, this model will allow you to look at, you know, how much improvement 
could be achieved. Um, but again, you know, things like participation is, is key. Um, consumers' behavior is key. Uh, the next question, how do you quantify hygienic condition variables of the food containers in case they do not wash it correctly? Or do you assume industrial washing is always required and reduces that risk to zero? Yeah, that's not something that, that we typically account for in terms of that it may not be washed correctly. It's generally something that we're going to assume is always washed correctly. But yeah, I mean, we're assuming that the restaurant is washing, you know, they have equipment they they get um, certified inspected we're presuming that you know they're washing um, correctly and um, you know there's yeah yeah all of our all of our washing that we analyzed is is restaurants that have a a, a commercial scale machine dishwasher while there is some uh, some restaurants which may be only outfitted with you know a typical hand washing like a three sink method uh that that's where you could run into some some potential issues but we typically just model the uh the machine uh washing from from the restaurant's perspective uh, but yeah there there could be some 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 more concerns but in a typical three sink method you're gonna you're you you will be sanitizing the 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 dishes so it's i think it's generally considered more safe in the in the reusable system but yeah uh what do you think about reusable containers slash plates slash bowls for in store too this would help reduce waste from the restaurant and eliminate the trip to return the containers if they were taken to go absolutely yeah in store is and it's a, something that's a lot more common which is i think why you know it's not included in our model it's less uh there, there's less issue like i would say typically most places that have the ability to wash dishes are probably already doing in store uh in, in store reusable like ceramic dining ware um, and you're typically mostly seeing uh disposable options for in store when it's in uh used in like fast food restaurants or something like that which is part of the 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 complaints we've been seeing with the 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 packaging regulations in in Europe, where they're trying to actually eliminate the the use of single use indoor packaging. So definitely, that one's kind of an easy win. We I would say. Uh, whether repeated washing will release microplastic particles into the soil, and how can this be reduced, or is it? Or are there any systems available to check this? So we did this material flow study of uh, plastics in the U.S. economy and how it's managed and how it um, um, enters the environment. And you know, so there's you know, a big part of the plastics end up in landfill, but there are microplastics that originate from various sources. Um, I would say that this risk um, in, in terms of the washing is going to be very is very low uh, in terms of overall impact. Um, I think you know littering is is a bigger issue with regard to um, containers, um, either single use or reusable. Those getting out into the environment by people just you know not properly uh, taking care of them, you know. Um, just letting them, uh, you know, go out the window of their automobile or whatever. Um, I think that's going to be a bigger impact than, than the um, effects of, of washing. Mm -hmm. And, but yeah, that is still definitely a, a valid concern with regards to the release of microplastics, but, and that's why there's been, uh, we've been, we've been looking into some other reusable materials. There's, uh, there's been uh, people making stainless steel containers as well that you would have less of a hopefully less of an issue with that and that's so we're, we're looking to expand the the scope of our materials that we use to to also look at some other materials that may have less uh, less impacts uh, that are not accounted for as much in our model such as the microplastics and final question, uh, how do customers' willingness to use the 
reusable, the multi-use container affect the results? Willing to, I guess is this, this might be in regards to willingness to use whether if, uh, a, like a, it's possible that, uh, like reusable plastic containers start to develop some sort of wear over time and, and maybe look less pristine. And I think there has been some, they might be referring to, uh, another research article that, that we used in our, in our discussion, which actually did do more of a, a willingness to use and whether, you know, certain, you know, you, you have your Tupperware at home that kind of does develop some, some issues of, you know, if you heated up something in the microwave with it, it gets stains or, and then, yeah, you might have the customers placing less value on it, being less willing to use it and, uh, and actually return it. So they, and it may, maybe even yes, throwing it away because they kind of deemed it as like, oh, it's, it's ruined. So that, that definitely can, can affect it. And it, it's not something that is uh, strictly included in our quantitative analysis, but definitely can be an issue for sure. If, uh, if, con if consumers are worried about the, the quality of the reusable container. And that's again, why we're hopefully hoping to look at different materials that may hold up better. And I would just add again, uh, consumers have a big role here and uh, just in terms of affecting performance and uh, you know, participation rates, reuse rates are, are critical. And I'd say one other uh, important factor, uh, you know, lesson beyond even the containers with regard to a food system is food waste. Um, you know, that, that wasn't what we modeled in our study, but we, our center has done a lot of work on, on food waste and, you know, 30% of edible food is wasted. Um, and that, that's going to dwarf the impact of the package. So um, not wasting food is another lesson to take away from our webinar here today uh, in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and impacts. And um, so, uh, yeah, a lot, lot can be learned out of a study like this. And uh, it's quite complex in terms of parameters as Christian um, highlighted. Uh, but I think, you know, our role is, is really to elucidate uh, and enhance the understanding, um, you know, for consumers, for restaurants, for municipalities that are designing systems, uh, scaling up systems, policymakers, uh, and uh, again, appreciate the journal uh, for um, publishing our paper, having it reviewed, uh, but also to organize this webinar for us today. We appreciate Mitchell in terms of your work in facilitating uh, today and um, enjoyed it. I'm so pleased, really I am. I think, you know, we all, we all, we all get a little bit stuck sometimes in our individual pods that we love so much. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing to be able to share that in a, in a, in a format that hopefully people will take something away from. And I think you guys, thank you so much for your presentation. I absolutely loved it. I think it's a, it's a topic that everybody should have close to their heart because it affects everybody. And it is a huge thing. We know that most plastic is used for packaging. Um, and anyone who has any real serious ambitions about doing the right thing for the environment, unfortunately needs to know some of these complicated factors uh, that you've so exactly. beautifully outlined for everybody. So thank you both so much. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you again. So in that, on that final, very, very nice note, um, I will introduce you briefly with our, our closing remarks to the, the next webinar, which will be Thursday week. So Thursday, two weeks from now. Um, it's going to be presented by Anna Lima from the Technical University of Denmark. She's going to be speaking with us on the topic of climate mitigation models must be circular. Let's start with the construction sector. That's the title of her presentation. That's uh, Thursday, September 21st, 2023 at 10 o'clock AM Pacific time. So a big, 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 big thank you once again to, to Christian, to Greg. Without you guys, our webinar program would not be able to run. So thank you for bringing your research on and, 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 and 
really giving us all this fantastic information and insight. Thank you again. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for providing such a great platform and we appreciate everybody for coming and for providing such great questions. Wonderful. Then uh, until Thursday week, a big goodbye to everybody.